The 1930s was a decade from hell. The stock market had crashed, sending the world into the Great Depression. In the United States, millions lost their homes and their jobs. Shanty towns popped up in major cities, and people begged and scraped for the basics of life. Out west, things were even worse because a massive ecological disaster was turning a once lush breadbasket into a barren, windswept desert. Mountain-sized storms engulfed whole towns, and animals and even people died with lungs full of dirt. This was the Dust Bowl, and it was unstoppable. But what caused this dangerous drought, and why did it last so long? The answer is more complicated than you might think, and it has a lot to teach us about how fragile civilization really is. By 1933, the American and Canadian high plains were drastically changed. In previous times, they had been filled with lush green grass, roaming wildlife, and prosperous farmers reaping great bounties. Now the ground was as hard as concrete. The corpses of dead animals animals littered the landscape, and the air was almost constantly filled with swirling dust and sand. This was the reality of the Dust Bowl, and it was an ecological disaster on a scale usually caused by volcanoes and asteroid strikes. All of this was happening at the height of the Great Depression, exacerbating a global financial crisis. Colorado and Kansas would face the brunt of this onslaught, and it would change America forever. In small towns across these and other affected states, the day-to-day -day was hard. These were small towns built on farming and frontier economies. Small ranchers and croppers would harvest and sell their goods at local markets and auctions. By the end of the 1920s, the populations of these states had exploded. The Homestead Act was an important bill that encouraged westward expansion. If you had a strong back and dreamt of owning your own land, you could make a new life. The act meant that if you settled on an unclaimed tract of land, built on and maintained that land, then it was yours. This encouraged scores of people to create new communities and stake their own homesteads in places like the Cimarron. Between the late 1800s and 1930s, the West came alive, and farmers were pulling in small fortunes from wheat and cattle. However, by 1934, these once thriving communities were ghosts of their former selves. The Great Depression had sharply reduced the price of wheat. Where once farmers could expect upwards of $1.50 per bushel, they now saw the demand fall to a measly 25 cents per bushel. This was less than it cost to grow, which meant that by 1935, most farmers couldn't make enough to justify planting anything at all. Of course, that was if they could grow anything to begin with. The Dust Bowl was at full power by 1935. It brought with it a cataclysmic series of conditions that made life all but impossible. As its name implies, the Dust Bowl was a near constant series of massive dust storms. These storms were generated by the endless winds that blow across the Great Plains. Once these winds had been a great benefit, spreading seeds and maintaining a temperate climate. Now with the plains dry and cracked, all the wind did was pick up dust and bury everything in sight. These dust swells could grow and grow until they were truly massive. Some dust storms ended up being miles wide and over a mile high. They would create literal mountain ranges of dirt that would cover entire towns, blanketing everything in a thick black dust. It made visibility impossible possible. People couldn't see their hands in front of their faces. Cars driving down the roads couldn't see past their hoods, even with their lights on. The dust encroached into every home. The storms would shatter winds and blow open doors, filling houses with dirt. Even inside cabinets and dressers, dust and sand would pile up. Bowls and cups would fill with soil, needing to be constantly cleaned. This wasn't the only place the dust would enter. It was also ending up in people's lungs. Being caught in one of these massive storms could quickly prove fatal. The air would fill with so many small particles that it would be suffocating to breathe. Many people, including children and the elderly, died gasping for air, feet from safety. If you were lucky enough to survive the storm itself, then you could look forward to dust pneumonia. This was a degenerative illness that could cause endless coughing, gasping, fever, and eventually death people's lungs would literally fill with mud. No family was untouched, with dozens of funerals every month. While people could seek shelter in homes and buildings, 
the animals weren't as lucky, once the plains had been filled with grazing animals like deer and cattle. However, after the Dust Bowl hit, these animals died by the thousands. The cattle that ranchers relied on were particularly hard hit. The change in the climate meant an explosion of tumbleweeds. These rolling thistles would collect on fences and barns. Swirling dust and dirt would then build on these tumbleweeds, creating ramps that livestock could walk over. Entire herds of cattle disappeared this way, with ranchers losing their entire livelihoods in a single day. Growing anything was impossible. There was no rain, which meant no moisture in the soil. Farmers tilled rock-hard ground, planting what they could. However, the dust storms would smother entire crops, killing the fledgling plants. Farmers tried to combat this by planting in large holes or building berms and other earthen barriers. However, while those offered some protection from the dust, they couldn't stop the electricity. All of the swirling dust in the air had another deadly and fascinating side effect. It would generate a massive amount of static. This static would build and build in the wake of a large storm. This electricity would literally fill the air to the point that many people reported its effects on their bodies. Long hair would stand on end. People stopped shaking hands because the shock would be so powerful. This electricity would also kill crops in the ground literally electrocuting sprouts and saplings to death. If the crops somehow managed to survive the bone-dry land, the smothering dust, and the searing electricity, they still had to contend with the rabbits. Thousands upon thousands of jackrabbits descended on the once fertile land. Like a horde of furry locusts, they consumed anything edible, everything green they could find, from whole crops to what little grass and vegetation was left. Their population had exploded because the coyote population had plummeted. With no natural predators, the fast breeding animals doubled and then tripled in population. This led many communities to organize mass culls of the rabbits, but that ended up doing very little to curb their spread. While the rabbits ate well enough, they were the exception. Whole families began to starve. They had to put together what little they could find to survive, from slaughtering remaining livestock to eating rotten and barely grown root vegetables. This desperation couldn't be ignored by the government, and Washington was hardly safe from the storms. The Dust Bowl was so powerful, the sandstorms even traveled as far as the White House. The biggest recorded storm during the bowl was so strong that President Roosevelt commented on the Resolute Desk being covered in a thin layer of Oklahoma. Many people had ideas about how to help those in need and stop the Dust Bowl once and for all. However, they were hardly practical or even recommended. Most independent companies had various ideas that amounted to covering the dirt. One asphalt company proposed paving over the entire state of Kansas, turning the plains into an endless parking lot. Others talked about using old cars to create a great wall, a barrier to block the wind and dust. While these were well-intentioned, all of these suggestions were fundamentally silly and ignored the staggering size of the Great Plains. Determined to save his nation from both the Depression and the Dust Bowl, FDR instituted a massive nationwide program to revitalize the economy and restore the land. He commissioned a full investigation into the cause of the Dust Bowl and what was needed to fix it. Much to their surprise, they soon discovered this wasn't a natural disaster or an act of God. It was a completely man-made event. So what caused this massive ecological change in a once prosperous land? Well, it was that very prosperity that caught up with the people enjoying it. The plains were once covered in a thick layer of grass. This particular grass was the secret weapon when it came to keeping the land fertile. It would trap mass amounts of moisture in the soil, keeping the dirt saturated with water. Before the Great Agricultural Revolution, farmers would till the land with hand and horse-drawn plows. The plows were made of wood or steel and would cut deep trenches into the ground, where wheat and vegetables would be planted by hand. This limitation kept the ground wet and fertile, and allowed season after season of harvesting. With the turn of the century came a massive change in how farming was done. Farmers now had access to gas-powered tractors they could run all day and night. This meant that they 
they could till and turn far larger patches of land. There was also a massive change in how they plowed. Instead of the bladed plows of old, the new tractors had disc-based systems. These new types of plow didn't just cut large trenches, they turned whole fields upside down. And grass that had evolved to store and protect the moisture in the land was now ripped up almost entirely. What water was left in the ground was quickly sucked up by the massive long fields of wheat and potatoes. These crops grew strong at first, but as they did, they seeped all the natural nutrients out of the soil. This was the same cause of a mass famine in Ireland less than a century before, and had now happened to America at the worst time. The collapse of the stock market and the Great Depression only made things worse. Once the prices of wheat and livestock began to collapse, the farmers had little choice but to increase their production. The more crops dropped in price, the more people had to grow to make a living. This created a feedback loop. Lower costs meant more wheat, which meant worse conditions, which meant lower prices, which meant more wheat. Finally, something had to break, and it did. The land became more and more infertile more and more dry. Once the land had dried up, all the loose soil from the endless tilling was free to be carried by the wind. A runaway effect began as more soil was lifted and then deposited all over the plains. It changed the entire landscape. Whole barns and houses were buried, with fences and cars entombed by sand drifts and piles of dirt. It was the lack of moisture in the ground that caused the feedback of dryness. With no water to evaporate, there were no clouds, and no clouds meant no rain to return water to the soil. The Dust Bowl would last around eight years. This would drive a mass exodus from the land where people had once flocked to. Many were forced to flee for their lives, as many families faced death and starvation. Millions moved to California, where the soil was still workable. However, many more stayed behind, determined to hold onto the land they had worked so hard to cultivate. Eventually, the Dust Bowl would end, but not without a massive cost. FDR's government created a huge jobs program that built waterways and reservoirs. They mandated limits on crop growth and the tools used. They commissioned films and pictorial efforts to educate the public on the causes and the things they could change to avoid another disaster. Eventually, the water returned and the soil had become fertile once more. Are you shocked by the scale of the Dust Bowl and how it changed America? Do you know any other stories from this desperate time in history? Share them in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos from History Snob. Thanks for watching.